Chapter 41 Link set the saddlebags onto Spirit, tying them down. A few arrows stuck out from one of the bags, courtesy of Robbie. Link would not go into the next Divine Beast fight without plenty of ancient arrows available. After securing Spirit's saddle, he turned back to the group of Sheikah that watched him, with hopeful expressions. This was it. The final step before taking on the Calamity itself. One final Divine Beast. Pura, as soon as I get to the desert, I'll seek out a shrine or tower. If anything happens in Hatsuno Village, send someone to come find me. I'll try to take care of things as quickly as I can. The situation in Hatsuno Village was getting worse. While the monsters gathering at the tower there still had not attacked the village, they had begun harassing travelers and merchants along the road. There had been a clash between a small squad of Zora and a band of monsters that left several dead on both sides. Pura played it off as nothing to worry about, but Simon had expressed his concerns that the attack would come soon. Link wished that he could do something about the monsters now, but the truth was he couldn't. He intended on being there when the attack came, however. He would not leave the villagers to fend for themselves, if he could avoid it. Not that he knew what he could do to turn the tide of battle. Just focus on your own tasks. Pura said, waving her hand in nonchalance. We'll worry about keeping everyone else alive. He nodded and looked at Robbie and Jaren. Thanks again for... everything. Your sword and arrow saved my life more than once. He reached out and took Robbie's hand, gripping it tightly. As he did so, something else occurred to him. Something that had been lost in the excitement of their reunion. Oh! I met your son! What? Jaren said, voice sharp with worry. You met Gronte. Where is he? Is he well? He's on his way here. I met him near the foot of Death Mountain two days ago. He's on foot, so it might take another few days, though. And you didn't tell us sooner? She looked at Robbie. Maybe I could take a horse out, see if I can find him. Do you think he'd take the north one or the southern roads? Jaren, dear. Robbie reached up, patting her arm. Grante has been all over half the country by now. I am sure that he can make it back here just fine. Link smiled a little sheepishly and turned to face Impa and Paya. I'll drop in at Kakariko, later this afternoon with Spirit. We will see you then, Impa said, patting his arm fondly. Paya merely smiled. He felt an odd sense of pride when looking at her. She was a tough woman, despite how she might have appeared at first glance. Link said one final farewell to the group, and then mounted Spirit, kicking him into a trot that took him down from the lighthouse, through Katsudo, and out into the Akala Highlands. By the time night fell, he intended on being in Rito Village, and on his way to the desert by morning. However, while he was here, he wanted to ride by Terrytown and see how the Bolson Construction Company was getting along. For a time, he let Spirit gallop through the large open field overlooking the sea. The view of the distant waves breaking upon the shore was soothing. Spirit eventually tired halfway through the field and Link dismounted. What do you say we take a short break? He said, as he pulled an apple from his pack and offered it to Spirit. Satisfied that the horse was cared for, he reached into his saddlebag and pulled out a small wrapped loaf of bread that he received from Kakariko Village that morning. He sat down in the grass facing the sea and took a bite of the bread, thinking. A moment later, he reached into his satchel and pulled out Zelda's diary, opening it to a new page. He already knew what it said, nearly by heart, but the memories surrounding it had thus far proved frustratingly opaque. Bit by bit, I've gotten Link to open up to me. It turns out he's quite a glutton. He can't resist a delicious meal. He smiled faintly at the cramped handwriting that only grew more familiar to him the more he looked at it. 
He had an image in his head of Zelda sitting on a stump, under the waning sunlight writing in her diary. He didn't know if it was something from memory, however, or if it was merely a picture that he created in his own mind. Do you think she'd be mad at me for reading her diary? He asked, looking up at Spirit. The horse, as was typical, ignored him, munching contentedly on the apple. It has been 100 years, and I rescued her diary from the castle. That has to count for something. Pushing the thoughts from his mind, he looked back down, continuing on. When I finally got around to asking why he's so quiet all the time, I could tell it was difficult for him to say. But he did. With so much at stake and so many eyes upon him, he feels it necessary to stay strong and to silently bear any burden. A feeling I know all too well. For him, it has caused him to stop outwardly expressing his thoughts and feelings. I always believed him to be simply a gifted person who had never faced a day of hardship. How wrong I was. Everyone has struggles that go unseen by the world. I was so absorbed with my own problems, I failed to see his. Link closed his eyes, focusing on the words. They felt familiar. Vaguely, he thought that he could recall saying such things, yet... An image popped into his mind. Link's eyes snapped open and he reached down, retrieving the Sheikah slate. He navigated to the gallery, flipping to a photograph that he'd seen before, but hadn't paid attention to it. A scene in the Gerudo Desert. There were palm trees in a stone well and... Gerudo women riding on sleds pulled by large seals. A racetrack. Nothing that spoke of the conversation in the diary, yet he could remember it. Sir Link, Princess Zelda said, looking around at him from her spot on the colorful blanket laid across the sand. You're hovering again. Link looked down at her, feeling a flush climb up the back of his neck. They were surrounded by people. Mostly Gerudo, true, but there were members of other races as well. He thought it would have been more appropriate if... She patted the blanket next to her. Sit, please. She held up a meat skewer. You need to eat, too. Well, if she insisted... He took his seat next to her, taking the meat skewer. He lifted it to his nose, smelling it and trying to determine what kind of meat exactly it was. Finally, he took a bite, and his eyes widened. This is delicious! He used his teeth to pull another piece of meat off the wooden skewer, savoring the blend of spices and whatever sauce the Gerudo had used to marinate it. He wondered if he could somehow recreate it. Princess Zelda held on her own skewer, though she ate it more delicately than he did. She gave him a slight smile. Somehow I thought you might like it. If I had known they'd served these every day, I would have set up camp over here. He paused, suddenly concerned. Would that be counted as abandoning his post? They have them in the city as well. Vendors in the streets compete with each other over different flavors and meats, she said, looking back at her own skewer. Much more variety than out here. Link had seen those vendors, though he kept that knowledge to himself. No need for the princess to know that tidbit. As far as he knew, Urbosa never told her of his attempts to enter the city particularly the last attempt. He certainly hoped it stayed that way. They fell silent as the next round of races began. He watched as the Gerudo women rode on their small sleds holding onto ropes or reins attached to the sand seals, which swam through the sand as easily as water. Their last day around Gerudo town was not to be spent studying the Divine Beast or investigating one of the Sheikah shrines. No, as Princess Zelda informed him that morning, she had other plans for the day. She wanted to watch Urbosa compete in the races, and she invited Link to join her. As it was outside of the city, he would be allowed to watch. The last week had changed things dramatically between them. He felt more comfortable around the princess now, and she seemed to feel the same way, often coming out of the city to discuss plans with him. She started in inviting him on trips to study the Divine Beast, or the nearby shrine. Sometimes she just came out to eat a meal and talk with him. It was strange how differently they interacted with each other now. She did still get annoyed with him from time to time, usually when he was too opaque about answering one of her questions, 
of which she had an endless supply, or when he was, as she put, hovering. She also occasionally still grew quiet, and even brusque, when she looked too long at the Master Sword. But he had been making efforts to be more open with her, and she responded in turn. They were developing something that Link knew from the way his father spoke of the king. A kinship. It was more than he ever truly expected to have with her, and he was grateful for the change. How much sooner could this have happened if he had been freer with his tongue from the beginning? There she is, the princess said, rising to her feet. He did as well, watching as Urbosa stepped aboard her sled for the next race. They were situated near the front of the small crowd of onlookers, in the center of the racetrack, near the start and finish line. From their vantage they would be able to see most of the race, though their view would be obscured when the racers passed behind them. Urbosa looked over at them and waved, saying something in her native Garuda tongue that Link didn't understand. Princess Zelda replied in turn, and Urbosa laughed throatily. Several of the other Gerudo around them chuckled as well. The princess frowned, her cheeks growing pink. I must have said something wrong. What were you trying to say? Link said, glancing at her. I was trying to wish her good luck, but... Savork. That doesn't sound right. Now that I think about it. Link thought for a moment of some of the language that he'd picked up all here. I think you told her... Goodbye. Good luck would be Sav Seark. Her eyebrows lifted. How do you know that? It's just something that I picked up. She continued to look at him curiously, but the race began drawing her attention back as Urbosa ululated and set off. She quickly gained speed, speeding ahead of most of the other Gerudo. Link watched until the Sandseal racers sped off, rounding the bend, and were largely taken out of view by the other gathered crowd. Princess Zelda craned her neck, trying to catch glimpses through the crowd. She stood on her toes, though Link expected that did very little to actually help. He found himself watching her instead. She seemed like a completely different person when she was able to relax and be herself. In their travels, she hadn't often felt she could relax around him. Now, however... The racers rounded the opposite bend, coming back into view again. Urbosa still had the lead, though another Gerudo woman was right beside her, urging her own seal on. The others raced through the cloud of sand kicked up by the leaders. Urbosa! Princess Zelda yelled, waving her hands in excitement. Come on! When the racers crossed the finish line, Link couldn't even tell who won. Others could, it would seem, as Urbosa was declared the victor. She raised her hands high in the air, and many of the Gerudo around them began ululating. The princess clapped along with the rest of them. Link didn't cheer, but he did find himself grinning, though he didn't particularly care who won the race. After a few minutes, the crowd began to relax again, and other races began. Urbosa's race had been an important one. The Gerudo chieftain did not often participate, but the races would go on for much of the day. He expected Urbosa to come join them, but she didn't, surprisingly. He and the princess sat back down to continue their meal. The day was hot, as they all were in the desert summer heat, but their place under the shade of tall palm tree helped some. He was sweating, but Princess Zelda looked comfortable. He expected that it had something to do with the sapphire circlet she wore. She told him about it the day before, something about latent magical properties and different types of gemstones that could be brought out with the right cut and setting. Sir Link, I have another question for you, she eventually said, glancing at him. It is a bit more personal than the others, and you do not have to answer, if you wish. More personal? It seemed to him that many of her questions were personal. She asked him about how he'd grown up, what his home was like, his preferences regarding food, his favorite season, and about a dozen other inquiries of varying importance. She even asked him if he liked dogs. He looked at her, and after a moment's hesitation, nodded. Why are you... She paused before revising what she was about to say. What I mean to say is that you are often very quiet. You've been more talkative to me lately, of course. 
but that only further highlights how quiet you are around others. Why is that? Ah, Link thought. I suppose I should have expected that question eventually, all things considered. He remained silent for a time, long enough in fact that the princess frowned, beginning to look uncomfortable. She opened her mouth again, possibly to release him from answering, but he finally spoke. It's... I would like to say that I'm just like that. She snapped her mouth closed, watching him. He didn't look at her any longer, though, fixing his eyes on a point on the distant horizon. I wasn't always, though. That was probably not entirely accurate. He'd always been introspective. When he was a squire, he tended to be among the quietest, but he was far more so now. But when I drew the Master Sword, it... changed you? Link hesitated, but then shook his head. No, it changed how everyone else looked at me. I'm still the same person, but... everyone else expects me to be so much more now. He felt a tightness in his chest. The burden of duty. How easy it was to forget it when enjoying a quiet afternoon with the princess. I... There is so much more at stake now, and everyone expects me to be their savior. They want to see me being strong and victorious. They don't want to know that their champion used to wrestle goats as a child, likes rock climbing, and isn't the strongest swimmer despite being taught by Zora. They don't want to know that he's not sure if he can live up to their expectations. He glanced at Princess Zelda. She was looking at him with an odd expression. She was listening intently, but looked surprised at what she was hearing. But of course, she didn't know. He never shared this with her. He wasn't even entirely sure why he was doing so now. So I... He looked away again, not sure he liked the way her expression made him feel. I give them what they need. I try to be strong and silent. I don't share what I'm thinking or feeling, because they don't want to know. They can't know. For them, I need to be more than what I am. He heard Princess Zelda gasp softly, and he inwardly winced, still not looking at her. Did she think less of him now? No, he didn't think that she would. But did she feel her own burden even more strongly, now that she knew he was unprepared as well? What hope did they have if neither of them could live up to their predecessors? I guess we are the same, you and I, she said, her voice soft, barely audible over the noise of the crowd around them. Princess? I... She began, but then stopped, meeting his eyes. Thank you for sharing this with me. I didn't realize that you felt such a burden upon your shoulders. I should have, of course, but... Well, that is in the past. She reached out, placing a soft hand against his arm. But I want you to know that going forward, I don't want you to worry about that around me. I've been around enough strong, silent nights in my life. I'm sick of them. He didn't know what to say, and she seemed fine with that. Her hand lingered for just a few moments, and it seemed to him that the princess had something else that she wanted to say. But she didn't. She finally pulled her hand away and smiled at him. And I think you are just fine as you are, she said, her voice adopting a familiar, decisive premise about it. It would do people some good to see their heroes living like normal people. After all, look at your bosa. She waved her hand towards where Abosa stood, laughing boisterously with a group of Gerudo all of whom had large goblets of some kind of drink in hand. She certainly doesn't care to be anything but her true self around the people that rely on her. Her voice grew contemplative. Perhaps that is something we both need to learn better. She stood up suddenly. Come on, let's get something to drink. What? She wasn't being serious, was she? Princess, I don't think I should be drinking anything. If someone were to attack... Nonsense was surrounded by a race of warriors. They're all quite loyal to Obosa, if not to me, and will be more than capable of defending us should the Yiga try anything. Besides, 
you don't have to drink a lot. But they have noble pursuit over there, and Nabosa hasn't let me try yet. She smiled defiantly. I'm going to try now, though. I'd just like to see them tell the princess of Hyrule no. He still felt a great deal of uncertainty, but he also didn't think that he could disobey her. Not when she looked at him with those eyes, an excitement shining in them. Finally, he stood, brushing some of the dust on his clothing. He could allow himself a single drink. That wouldn't be enough to impair him. I wish to talk with him more, and to see what lies beneath those calm waters, to hear him speak freely and openly, and perhaps I, too, will be able to bear my soul to him and share the demons that have plagued me all these years. Link traced the words in Zelda's diary with his finger, waiting for the lump in his throat to fade. The memory had been vivid. He felt the heat of the desert sun on his skin, tasted the savory meat skewers, and felt his own contentment, as if he were truly still there. He didn't know if the princess ever truly knew how much he appreciated her willingness to accept him for who he was, rather than who he needed to be. In truth, he didn't even fully understand the depth of his appreciation beyond what he'd felt in the memory. The weight that he lifted off his shoulders as he stood to go with her. It had been like a breath of fresh air. Things had been different since he woke, though he felt that same burden of expectation. He hadn't retreated into himself as much as he had in the past, however, and even found other friends with which to share his burden. Sedan, Cass, even Impa and Paya. They cared about him, not just because of what he represented, but who he was, just as Zelda had. Terrytown had changed since Link last saw it. As he rode Spirit up to the land bridge that connected to the round island in the center of the lake, he saw quite a few more buildings constructed than when he'd last been there. The headquarters building that Hudson and his employees had been working on appeared to have long since been completed, and he saw their sign which boldly proclaimed North Bolson Construction Company hanging above the door. Other buildings had been constructed in the meantime as well. They appeared to be constructing homes and other buildings in concentric rings, with an open area in the center for the town square. The Goron help that Link sent appeared to have been well used, as he couldn't see any evidence of the rocky outcrops that previously covered much of the island. He did notice that stone was used in quite a few of the new constructions, however, as well in the laying of cobblestone. Even the sign with the town's name had been improved with stone at its base. Link rode into the center of town, looking around. The town had grown in population as well, it would seem. Not only did he see several of the burly construction workers moving around, transporting tools and materials, but he saw others as well. At least two of the recently built homes appeared to be occupied by families, and he recognized one family as having living previously in New Kasudo. He dismounted and walked over to one of the buildings that was still in the process of being constructed. Once he arrived, he was somewhat surprised to see the pair of Gorons, Grayson and the young Pelison, both within the building. Pelison handed wood up to Grayson, while the older Goron worked on framing a doorway within the house. Several other of the construction workers were present as well, though Link didn't see Hudson anywhere. Brother, Pelison said when Link stepped into the house. Grayson turned and grinned broadly when he saw him. Brother, what are you doing here? Link smiled as he looked around at the building, which appeared to be mostly completed, though it still lacked paint both on the inside and out. I'm just stopping by while in the area. I wanted to see how things were coming along. Oh yeah, things are great here, Grayson said. We got those rocks broke up in no time. The stone was way softer down here than up on Death Mountain. After that, Hudson had us start helping chop down trees and build some of these houses. I didn't expect you to stay down here after finishing with the rocks. I figured you'd be going back up to Death Mountain. Oh, it's nice down here, brother. Me and Pelison are going to stick around for a while. Hudson seems to think we're a big help. Well, great, Link said. Any idea where Hudson is? Want to say hi to him as well. Should be in the next building over. They're just getting started on the second floor over there. 
Link spent another minute in the house with the Gorons and the other workers before stepping back outside. As he did so, a shadow passed overhead, and he looked up in surprise to see Fison, the Rito, landing on another of the buildings. He began to work on hammering some new shingles onto the roof, though he lifted a wing and waved it when he saw Link on the ground below him. Feeling buoyed by what he'd already seen, Link stepped into the other house, and came face to face with Hudson. The tall man looked down at Link in surprise, and then smiled broadly. Link! Didn't know you were coming by today. I was in the area. Link reached out and shook Hudson's hand while looking around the half-constructed building. Terrytown has grown since I was last here. Yeah, we move fast. Clearly. Yep. They both fell silent. Link cleared his throat. Did your rich benefactor move in yet? Nope. Hudson stepped out of the building, and Link followed him. They made their way over to the company building, stepping inside. Inside, the building was furnished sparsely, with muted colors painted on the walls. It seemed at odds with the bright colors that the building's exterior had been painted. Hudson walked to the wooden desk in the corner and placed a hand against it, smiling. Feels good to have this here now. Built it myself. Link moved up beside him. I'm glad to see things moving along so quickly here. By the time I get back, I bet you're going to have the entire town built. Probably, Hudson said, nodding. But we need more people. What about Hatsuna? Aren't people supposed to be moving out here? Yeah, but I mean more than that. We need our craftsmen. We've got a merchant now, but he needs more to sell. Well, I'm sure Terrytown will keep growing over time. Hudson looked at him, his expression grave. Or at least Link thought it was. It could be hard to tell with the man sometimes. No, we need more craftsmen soon if we're going to be able to keep working. Why do you say that? Well, we're running out of vests, for one. What? Construction is rough work. Clothes get ruined easily. Hudson picked at his vest, where Link saw a tear in it that had been very poorly sewn back together. Link genuinely had no idea what to say in response to that. So you need a tailor? Yes. Why don't you just send someone to buy more clothes? Kasudo isn't even a day's ride to the east. Maybe they have a tailor there that could make you some new clothes. They only have one tailor, and he's been sick lately. Hudson shrugged. Pretty old. What about Fison? He could fly somewhere else to pick up the clothing. Hudson considered, pursing his lips. Finally, he blew a heavy breath through his mustache. That's not a bad idea. See if he can fly to Hotno and pick us up some. Link smiled slightly. Hudson actually made him think a lot of Daruk in a way. Easily as blunt as the large Goron, though not nearly as talkative. Still, it'd be good if we got a tailor. And a cobbler. We'll need a blacksmith, too. I'm sure they will eventually come, Link said. He eyed Hudson curiously. Weren't you just hired to build a few buildings? Hudson shrugged. I'm in charge here until someone else moves in. Someone's got to look out for the residents. I guess you're right, Link said. He still thought that Hudson's concerns extended far beyond those typical of someone in his station. Well, if I meet a tailor on the road, I'll make sure to send them your way. As long as they adhere to the Bolson Construction Company naming standards. Link's smile disappeared. Hudson, they wouldn't really be working for the construction company, would they? I mean, I sent Fison, sure, but I didn't even really think he'd go. I don't make the rules, Link. But you just... Ugh, Link sighed softly. What about your new residents? Do they all have the names ending in Sun? Nope, but we didn't hire them. They just showed up one day. But if a tailor walks into town tomorrow and offers to set up shop, you'd refuse him if his name isn't, right? Hudson frowned deeply. Why would I do that? You just told me that a tailor would have to have the right name. No, I told you that. If you found one for us, he would have to have the right name. We're acting on behalf of the Bolson Construction Company. So you must abide by the rules. But I don't have the right name, Link protested. We're volunteering. So that doesn't count. Just like if anyone showed up tomorrow, like you said. Link eyed the tall man, bemused. He was beginning to wonder if this was all some kind of elaborate joke. 
but he also supposed that it didn't truly matter. He was invested in seeing Terrytown grow, and he wasn't about to scour the nation to find someone who matched Hudson's needs. Just like before, if he found someone, he would mention Terrytown. That was all. Finally, he nodded. All right, Hudson. I'll keep an eye out. If I find someone, I'll make sure to send them your way. He paused. That's probably unlikely, though. I'm going to the Gerudo Desert next. I don't know how much luck I'll have finding someone to match your specifications. You never know, Hudson said, shrugging. The Gerudo are good tailors, though. But am I going to find someone with the name ending in Sun, who is willing to travel to the other side of the country? Link asked, smiling slightly. Hudson considered that, and then he shrugged again. Maybe. Link's smile grew. I'll keep an eye out. He patted Spirit's nose. The horse seemed agitated now that he was back in the stable, in Kakarika Village. He knew that his master would be leaving again. I know, boy. But I don't think he would enjoy what I'm about to do, Link said, soothingly. From what I've seen, the desert isn't very hospitable to many horses. Besides, I don't know how I could even get you down. Spirit snorted, fixing him with one accusatory eye. Don't look at me like that, he said. You know you get spoiled here. I happen to know that Paya has a large stockpile of sugar cubes. I'll make sure to ask her to share some with you. The horse snickered softly and pressed his face to Link's shoulder. He smiled, hugging him tightly before handing the lead rope to the young Sheikah boy that was looking over the stable in the evening. He turned around to find Impa and Paya standing behind him, both looking excited and apprehensive. This goodbye felt different. Portentious. I'll make sure I share lots of sugar cubes with him, Paya said, smiling. He grinned. Not too many. I need him to still be able to run when I get back. Spirit snorted behind him. Impa approached, handing Link a pouch. It felt as though it contained a large number of rupees. Now, I haven't traveled to the desert in the past century. But from what I have heard, it has not changed a whole lot. You won't be able to enter the city. You don't really think they'll refuse the champion of Hyrule, do you? You don't remember much of Gerudo's stubbornness, do you? Well, if it's anything like princess stubbornness... Impa smacked his arm. Enough of that! Just because you've managed to remember that you did eventually become friends doesn't mean you can speak about the princess so flippantly. But can't I? Link thought, though he did not share these out loud. She's the one who told me there are no titles between us. He glanced down at Impa and saw a knowing smile on her lips. He chose not to comment on that either. I'll be back as soon as I can, he said. We'll be ready, Impa said, her smile replaced with an expression of fierce determination. The time of the calamity is coming to an end. Paya nodded, looking fierce in her own right. She had changed since the night of the assassination attempt. She carried a Sheikah sword at the small of her back. Link smiled at them both, but felt nervous despite his earlier confidence. What would they think if he never returned? He didn't want to put them through that again, especially not Paya. He still felt guilt over what his earlier disappearance had clearly put her through. So he stood up straighter, pushing his worries below the surface. He wore a pack upon his back, everything he would need in the short term. He wore the Master Sword underneath the pack, but the shield was attached to the pack itself. The blue champion tunic made to look just like the one crafted by Zelda's own hand stood out brightly in the moonlight. He removed the Sheikah Slate, finding the shrine near the Rito City. He met their eyes one last time, and then pressed his finger to the shrine. A moment later, he disappeared from Kakarika Village, and appeared at the base of the shrine. Rito Village shone with light as he approached. Even though the moon was already high in the sky overhead, most of its inhabitants still appeared to be awake. The shadowy forms of Rito flew overhead, but none of them immediately took notice of the lone Hylian approaching the Great Spire. Meadow still perched from the spire's peak, watching over its home. The Rito guards near the bridges that crossed the gaps to the city itself balked when he approached. Sir Link? One of them asked, stepping forward with a torch. We didn't know that you were... It was feared that... 
Sir Link? That's new. I'm alright. Just got delayed from returning for a time. He hesitated. No one is out looking for me right now, are they? Not that I know of, but... He turned to his companion, frowning. I'll go tell Teba. The Rito spread his wings and took off before Link could object. Link sighed softly and waited. Thankfully, he didn't have to wait long before a new Rito form appeared, swooping down and landing directly before him. Teba, eyes wide, stared at Link. You're alive, he said, voice lacking its typical gruffness. Last I checked, Link smiled broadly. I'm sorry, I... He cut off as another shadow passed overhead. Cass had barely even landed before laughing and stepping forward, placing a wing on Link's shoulder. I should have known you would just show up one day. Better late than never, Link patted Cass's wing. Indeed, but what happened? We searched for you after your Sheikah slate was found, but there was no sign. I was being hunted by the Guardians, so that's a good thing. But Link reached back and unsheathed the Master Sword. I also had to go fetch this. What's that? Teba asked, stepping forward and crossing his wings with a frown. The Master Sword, Cass said, eyes widening. It is just like its descriptions. And you found it. You must tell me about it. I will, I promise. Link slid the sword back into its scabbard. But first, I want to talk to Rivali. We're leaving tomorrow morning for the desert, and I want to make sure he's ready to go. Good, Teba scowled. He's been agitated ever since you didn't show up again. He's as annoyed as a damned goose. Link laughed. He can be. Come on, let's go see him, and then I'll tell you everything that's happened. There's a lot to discuss.